Thank you, Jonathan. Well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, it's a blessing here to come and to sit under God's word again and, and, and to look and to see what the Lord has for us. And in this very interesting portion of scripture, I find something very unique. I, I think something that'll press us a little bit uh, in our thinking, how to think biblically in these areas as uh, Paul talks about citizenship and, and Roman citizenship, you know, uh, something that's, that's a bit of a, a debate in our culture and, uh, and in a, a debate within the church as well, is nationalism wrong? Should we be proud to be Americans? As we know the song says, but at least we know we're free. If you were a Christian, would you call yourself an American Christian or a Christian American? Or maybe would you be embarrassed to even call yourself an American? Please, just call me a Christian. We think about uh, what's going on in Afghanistan, that our country was there and, and that there were soldiers dispatched and, and we pulled out of there. And, and uh, I, I don't want to comment at all, obviously, on the involvement of America in foreign lands. I think there, that's, there's a lot to be thought about there. But the fact that we are there and the fact that we pulled out I think as Americans, we should feel some sort of a, a love for those folks that were from our country that maybe were left in the lurch. That we can think of those soldiers that, that out of their hearts they were doing the best they can to serve their country and to answer the call uh, to foreign lands. Uh, so it breaks my heart that Americans may be left there in the lurch. But, but this idea of, uh, of nationalism and how does that relate to being a Christian? And I, I really think here in the more middle of this scripture, we're kind of pressed upon a little bit. That Paul today uh, declares seemingly proudly that, that he's a Roman, that he depends on his Roman citizenship for some sort of safety and freedom. And, and I want to look at that. Uh, as we look at this little portion of scripture, I want to recognize that true freedom comes from God. True freedom comes from God. In the midst of this scripture here, we're going to see lawlessness and bondage. I want to see lawlessness, law, excuse me, lawlessness and bondage, lawfulness and appeal to freedom, and then I want to recognize the liberator. As I said, freedom alone comes from God. And we know that this is a very uh, interesting portion of scripture um, where we have the Jews Paul, again, being a Jew of the Jews, a Hebrew, he'd been appealing to his own countrymen, according to the gospel, trying to preach the gospel to them. His own countrymen want to kill him. So I guess it doesn't help him that he's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Away with such a man from the earth, for he's not fit to live. Lawlessness, bondage. The Jews determined that Paul was not no longer worthy of life or liberty. Not only not worthy of liberty or life, but deserving of death. If they had their way, they would have pulled him to pieces when they kicked him out of the temple. So we have what Matthew Henry says is this about this. He tried to explain. I mean, they're, they're throwing dirt in the air. They're throwing their clothes off. They're, they're beside themselves with anger towards Paul. And Matthew Henry describes it this way. They went stark mad against Paul and against the chief captain for not killing him immediately at their request or throwing him as a pry into their teeth that they might devour him as men whose reason was quite lost in passion. They crowd out, cried out like roaring lions and raging bears and howled like the evening wolves. They cast off their clothes with fury and violence, as much as to say that thus they would tear him if they could. Lawlessness. These men that pride themselves on the law were ready to take away Paul's life, liberty, and kill him without a fair trial. They would have him, they would have killed him 
themselves, except for this, uh, this Roman commander who we're going to see in this next little while as God has Paul appeal before kings and eventually before Caesar, his Roman citizenship is going to play a big part in this. But this Claudius Lysias is the commander's name, we're going to find out. He intervened to rescue Paul. If he hadn't, the very thing that happened to Stephen would have happened to Paul. It says uh, earlier on, as we remember, when he went to intervene, when they had thrown uh, Paul out of the temple and slammed the door behind them, that the whole city was in an uproar and they wanted to kill Paul. And the commander came and delivered him as they were seeking to kill him. Was Paul deserving of death? Did he commit a crime deserving of death? Absolutely not. This was lawless action by the Jews. Now, Claudius Lysias, who was his savior in this instance, does not exactly roll out the red carpet for Paul. Claudius still was not sure if Paul was a criminal or not. His idea was to get to the bottom of things, to find out what's the truth concerning Paul. So he binds Paul, we know he's bound with two chains, and that he uh, delivers him to the Roman centurion, the soldiers, uh, Cla Claudius is the commander, delivers him to the centurion so that he might be, uh, they might beat the truth out of him. Are you a criminal? Why are they so mad at you? Again, some lawless actions. They brought him into the barracks, and the bottom line was to torture him to torture him. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. So at this point, Paul, being delivered from death, finds himself strung up to a, a, a pole and his arms stretched out and he's gonna be scourged. He's gonna be whipped so that they might find the truth out about him. Uh, the rioters uh, were, were were, were dispatched, and here he is, and F.F. F. Bruce describes it this way, despairing of getting any coherent explanation of all the sound and fury of the rioters, the Tribune decided to find out the truth from Paul himself by interrogating him under torture. He therefore ordered him to be flogged. If the instrument used was the scourge, that was a fearful instrument of torture, consisting of le leather th thongs weighed with rough pieces of metal and bone and attached to a stout wooden handle. If a man did not actually die under the scourge, he might truly be crippled for life. Paul here being examined to find out the truth. Again, complete lawlessness upon Paul, cruelty. If you watched any of the, the movies, this is where the hero is captured by the bad guys brought in, strapped to a chair, beaten to within an inch of his life, and then they bring out some, some pliers to pull his nails out one at a time that they might find the truth out. Uh, this is lawless and horrific, what's going on to Paul. Cruel bondage and torture. We still see it in the world today, don't we? We still see the same sort of cruelty and lawlessness. Uh, we hear about it all over. This was the picture of where Paul was with his hands tied and completely at the mercy of those Roman soldiers. When we encounter this narrative of Paul being derided by this angry Jewish mob, them calling for his death, throwing dirt up in the air, we can't help but remember previous years before when a very same and similar scene worked itself out where they called for the death of Jesus bringing Jesus before Pilate to be killed. Jesus, who already had endured cruel scourging at the hands of the Romans, he was mocked and despised and beaten beyond recognition, a cruel thorn, crown of thorns being placed on his head, a reed put in his hand as they bowed down and they, they mock worshipped him, his back being exposed with the bone and the sinew. You see, though, Jesus was the most innocent man to ever live. Yet he went through all that. Paul is not a, a sinless man. 
Uh, but here today in this portion, he's going to be delivered. When it was Jesus' time, Pilate tried to release him, but they prefer a criminal. Jesus delivered over to be crucified. So would that be Paul's portion today? Would that be where he would end up? Jesus voluntarily laid his life down. Shouldn't it be for the Christian to do the same? Shouldn't we walk in Jesus' footsteps? Shouldn't we lie our lives down like Jesus did? You have to recognize that Jesus and Paul are quite different. Their plan and their what God has proposed for Jesus to do was completely different of what God had called Paul to do in carrying forth the gospel and bringing the message of, 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 of deliverance. Jesus laid his life down voluntarily so that he might bring freedom to all. But now Paul today, faced with this kind of, uh, of, of torture and, and put death. Listen, Paul would have died that day, except Paul appeals for justice in this lawless situation. Paul pulls the citizenship card. Hey, I'm a Roman. I'm a free man. He makes appeal to due process and to law. So we see law, lawlessness and bondage completely displayed there. But we can't confuse Paul with Jesus. Keep your Bibles open with you as we go through this little portion of Scripture. We're in Acts chapter 22, as Jonathan read. And, and I'm at verse 25. I'm going to see point two. First, we saw lawlessness and bondage. But let's see lawfulness and appeal to freedom. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said, this, said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? The NIV says, Is it legal for you to flog a, human, a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Is it legal, the message says, torturing a Roman citizen without a fair trial? Paul's not going to go the same route that the Lord Jesus went. Paul is declaring his freedom as a Roman citizen. Paul is making an appeal for freedom. Jesus never demanded fair treatment. He laid his life down as a lamb before its shears was done. He could have. He's the only one that could have ever said, I don't deserve this. But he voluntarily did that. You see, now we're not, and neither is Paul, anything like carrying out those same sorts of things. Our persecution, our suffering is completely different from the type of suffering that the Lord suffered. So I wanna, what can we learn from this when Paul demands his citizenship? Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, remember, remember, from Tarsus, no small city. He was proud of the city he came from. The fact that he was a Roman citizen would keep him from this cruel scourging. He surely would have died in, justice, in, in an unjust way under either the Jews or the Romans there and then at the hands of that mob. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, all of a sudden, all bets were off. Here he is about to be scourged and beaten to within an inch of his life. All he has to say, is it lawful to beat and to scourge a Roman citizen who's not even been found guilty? Is this legal? All of a sudden, the commander and the centurion, the centurion's done, he stops. He lays his, his whip aside, tells the soldier, put that, that, that scourge down. He runs to the commander and he says, take care of what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, now this is the, the commander, right? So the centurion, who's the commander of hundreds, has soldiers ready to beat Paul to death. It couldn't be any more dire. And the centurion hears this, stops the soldier, runs to find the commander, who, who knows where he is, maybe with his feet up on the desk, waiting for word of the truth. And he says, this is a Roman citizen. And the commander runs into where Paul was to ask if this is true. Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes. By law, Roman citizens could not be flogged or crucified when on trial uh, and could appeal to the emperor. Roman citizens in the first century Roman Empire 
had special privileges as free citizens of the Roman Empire. And Paul completely takes advantage of this. Paul was a man whom the Tribune was interrogating rather contemptuously, was born a Roman citizen, Paul. This means that his father was a Roman citizen before him. How the citizenship was acquired by Paul's father or grandfather, we have no means of knowing. Because we know Paul, he is a Jew. He, his father is Jewish, he's of the tribe of Benjamin, he's a Jew of the Jews. But he's also a Roman citizen because he's a born Jew. So in somewhere, either his father or his grandfather got the Roman <laughs> citizenship given to them, maybe by loyal service to Antony or uh, to, to Pompey, but, but now it's passed down to Paul, and Paul has this citizenship, and he uh, takes advantage of it. Uh, the commander says, of course, with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. Paul says, yeah, but buddy, I was freeborn. In this, I think, as we see this portion of scripture, I want to recognize the glorious difference between Jesus and Paul. Jesus died and suffered in order to secure freedom. Paul declared his freedom as a Roman citizen not to suffer that way. I see as we hear there that, that Lysias says, I had to pay for my Roman citizenship. It came at incredibly great price for me. Whereas Paul says he was born a, a free citizen. Um, and it has to remind us again back to Christ, these two stories of Paul and then of Christ, that freedom was purchased at an incredibly high and cruel cost at the blood of our Lord Jesus, that it was spilt that we might have true freedom. But Paul is a Roman citizen. He doesn't need to go through all of that. He's been delivered simply because he's a free man born Roman. But you have to see the juxtaposition there of Jesus. So when I think about freedom, freedom being from God, Jesus went through everything he went through. Why? To obtain freedom. Freedom from sin, hell, death, and the grave. To make men, women, and children able to breathe free. John 8, 36 says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Freedom and liberty came from God. Freedom, again, is secured by the Son of God at a very incredible great price. But here we see Paul, very interestingly, standing on his Roman citizenship. So I go back to that original question. Here as Americans, as Christian Americans in the United States of America, is it wrong for us to look to our heritage as Christians who have had freedoms in this nation, I believe, because of our Christian heritage of forefathers that had partaken of freedom through faith in Christ, who then created laws so that we might have a constitution. See, the right reason Paul was saved is they had a constitution, the Romans. There was a law and there were things that protected Paul. And so now making the comparison to us here in, the, in America, this is the question. Is our country just happenstance that a couple deists really formed our country? Or the narrative that goes around now that our, our heritage was by predominantly evil men that were slave owners, that, that had no real sense of what freedom and truth is about? Is, is there anything to be said about citizenship in America or, or Christian or, or, or American? So many Christians saw the most precious freedom as being that of true liberty we receive through Christ. So as Paul asserted his Roman citizenship and freedom, I believe it's right today as Christians to recognize our heritage in America that it's founded on a constitution that secures freedoms. Yes. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. The First Amendment says that we might be able to freely assemble, freely worship, and, and, and freely practice our religion. This isn't happenstance. We have a godly heritage in this country. Paul was willing to afford himself of his Roman heritage 
Is it wrong in America for us to stand and to appreciate our heritage as American Christians? Oh my goodness, that's so terrible. You're such a nationalist, such a Christian nationalist. What are you going to do, parade the flag out and worship it now? But this nation was founded on principles that saw freedom as something that came from God. So I think it's right for us to consider this. Because we learned this morning as we're talking about Scripture and what God's plans and His promises are in the world, we got to understand who we are and, and, and what we believe and how it affects us here in this nation. Because in this nation, we have a different government. Right now, the freedoms are under attack from within our own government. The freedoms that we enjoy are under attack from people in our nation that, that are trying to completely rewrite history, that are completely humanistic and lawless and man-centered. So we should just, those freedoms don't mean anything, do they? Do we need to fight to preserve them? Is it biblically right for us to see that there's benefit to being an American citizen with a heritage of, of, of values that, that, that come from Christianity? And listen, the reason I think it's okay is because freedom comes from God. We are first and foremost Christians. So, so Paul, was he a Roman Jew or a Jewish Roman? Or am I a Christian American, American Christian? I'm a Christian American. The, the, the freedom I enjoy is because of Christ. And that was recognized by a vast amount of those that formed our nation, those in the history of the United States. I know that's under debate, but we can't just adopt what people are telling us is the right narrative. We've got to search the scriptures to see what's true and search American history to see what we have of value in defending and keeping our freedoms. Abraham Kuyper quotes George Bankford History of the United States, the famous chronicler of American history, and he tells you, my nation's enthusiasm for freedom was born from its enthusiasm for Calvinism. The American Republican ideals come from scripture as Calvin perceived them and enacted them in Geneva. These are the very same ideals that our country was founded on. Kuyper quotes Kelvin's Christian Institute's big book for this way. The Republican form of government, whether it be solely aristocratic or a mixture of aristoc or aristocratic and democratic elements, seems to me much to be preferred. This belief was not rooted in some idea of human greatness, but rather in his profound sense of sin. For he adds, because of sinful human nature, it is safer and better to let several people together steer the ship of a state so that one may restrain the other when the lust for power might denigrate into tyranny. Separation of powers. Where did they come from? They came from Christian ideals in the founding of our nation. That's why our Constitution sets up three branches of government so as to separate power of a government, of the people, by the people, and for the people. So that freedom might be preserved, so that we might preach the gospel, so that we might be free as Trevor is to have devotion and raise his family rightly. Amen. So I wanna be thankful for the heritage I have as a Christian. Rome, or Abraham Kuyper, again, quoting Kelvin in relation to this Roman Tribune, as we see in this text today, and on the ideals of American government. What if, what if the government oppresses the citizens? <laughs> That's not a what if. <laughs> That's going on, okay? What if the government oppresses the citizens? May a private person take up arms? Never, Kelvin says. And if the government commands something contrary to God's honor, not then either. You should refuse to obey and take the punishment. We ought to obey God rather than man, uh, John and, and Peter said. But, Kelvin doesn't stop there, but if you ask Kelvin whether there is no means of resistance at all, he hastens to add, 
I always speak of private persons. For if there are among a people secondary powers which derive their authority from the people, like tribunes in Rome, and today three estates of parliament, as is, 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 uh, Kuiper would see in his nation, far from encouraging them to remain passive, I would accuse, accuse them of having broken their oath if they abandon the liberties of the people which they have swore, sworn to defend. He's talking about lesser magistrates. He's talking about sheriffs, he's talking about mayors, he's talking about those that may have made a, 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 an oath that they might defend the people. He goes on to say, thus with Calvin himself lies the origin of the system of secondary powers, this lesser magistrates, of the banner under our states rose against Philip, the English parliament against the Stuarts, and, and Kuiper sees in the Americas colonies against the mother country, the glorious principle from which our constitutional system was born. So I think it, we need to, as American citizens and as Christians, we need to know both. We need to be Christians, of course, first and foremost. We must know the word of God. But then how does the word of God cause us to be right civic citizens? What does it entail upon us as Americans? Paul didn't just lay his life down. His purpose was not to lay his life down. His purpose was to preach the gospel. Jesus came to be a substitute. He came to seek and to save the lost. It was his destiny to die so that we might have salvation secured. The disciples were persecuted. Most all of them died. Still today there are those that are martyred for their faith but we are called to spread the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. Are we all destined to be martyred? Maybe some of us in that pursuit. But should we not in, uh, try to see our freedoms restored under God and stand for them rightly? I think if we learn anything from Paul here, yes, we should. He even encouraged us in 1 Timothy Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, it's awful tough to preach the gospel when they won't let you. Can we pray for freedom? Should we stand for freedom? Or should we just lay down our freedoms? The reason this nation has been a light to the world is because the Gospels had free reign in the past. I think we must enact and, 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 and engage in our Christian rights and privileges, and we also, as Paul has, need to see what our rights and privileges are as Americans, that we might not just haphazardly lay them down. That's what happens in a society where the government becomes oppressive and overpowering. Mm -hmm. People just say, oh, that's what, that's what we got to do? Okay. All right. Ignorant. Ignorant of the scriptures. Ignorant of what we need to know and understand. So all I'm trying to say is pushing back here, there's a way to properly understand all this. And not everybody believes the narrative that being American is bad. And that it's not something to be valued and, and, and appreciated. And that we have a, a heritage to be valued. So finally, the third point, the Lord and liberator. Freedom comes from God. Our forefathers fought it, and it was teached very, taught very clearly. Look at verse 29. See what happens here is then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. They feared retribution from the higher-ups from Rome. They feared that if they just haphazardly took Rome, uh, his citizenship and, and just killed him without a trial, that they would come and take their freedom away, that they may have to die. Paul here is basically living out what he teaches in Romans chapter 13 about the authority of government, 
about the bearing of the sword properly. You see, they fear. And actually, when Paul wrote Romans 13, and you can turn to it quickly, I'll just quote a little bit. Maybe I, maybe I should wade into those deep, difficult waters. But I think we can touch on it today and see what Paul's doing here in appealing to his citizenship and appealing to the, the government of that time, which was Rome, and that commander and those leaders, that they might bear the sword rightly and that they might enact true freedom and justice in this case. Let every soul, Paul writes, be subject to the governing authorities. We all get that. They tell you that. Be subject to the governing authorities. And it's right. And it's true. God calls us to be submissive. God calls us to submit to the Father. God calls us as husbands to submit to the Lordship of Christ. God calls women to submit to their husbands. God calls us to submit to good godly authority, to good authority in the church. This is right. For he is God's minister to you for good. But I'm going to jump ahead first. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except God. The authority that is existing, it comes from God. It's appointed by God. Even the authority that was going on over Paul there, and we know over Jesus as well. But then verse 4 says, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath, on him who practices evil. So they rightly feared if they did wrong and did not work, act justly with Paul that they were to fear. But this fear, if you rightly see the line of it, is a true and right fear of God. Because civil government has authority given to them to bear the sword from God. And the civil authorities are responsible to the Lord Jesus to enact those authorities rightly. They'll answer to the Lord. So those who don't come to God are restrained by civil. Now here's the two things. So it's so easy to go, well, it's impossible. People are sinners. We're going to live in sin. Yeah, that's true. So there's two ways things are going to happen. Those that come to Christ and get true freedom, the law of God is placed upon our hearts. Those that don't and still live in sin, civil government rightly is supposed to uphold the law of God. You shall not murder, you shall not kill, and, and, and those sorts of things to protect. So preaching Jesus by the gospel, that brings forgiveness of sin for all who repent and trust in him. God writes his law in their heart. But those who are not, God calls civil government to bring order order to communities, order to governments, orders to countries. In our country, we've rightly in the past had our civil government rightly attached to the word of God. So let me, you're going, oh, you're crazy. Speak from a, a Puritan. Where are you getting all this craziness? Matthew Henry says this on the benefit of godly appointed governmental authority. Thus, many are restrained from evil practices by the fear of man who would not be restrained from them by the fear of God. You get that? You get what's going on? That's why those guys are afraid of man to do wrong. So here, the benefit of human laws and magistrates and what reason we have to be thankful to God for them, Henry says. For even when they have given no countenance nor special protection to God's people and ministers, yet... By the general support of equity and fair dealing between man and man, they have served to check the rage of wicked and unreasonably illegal men who otherwise would know no bounds and, 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 and go further. Hitherto, right civil government says you can only go this far no further. There's something to be said about right government submitted to God rightly. This is the context, the very context by which all of the Acts of the Apostles are laid out for us. This is the whole context of the New Testament. Looking back to the promises in the Old Testament, I think of Isaiah talking about the government being upon this one that would be born and upon his shoulders, of the increase of his government and peace there would be no end. That jumps right forward to where Jesus said, all authority had been given to him in heaven and earth, he being the Lord of, of all the spheres of influence in the world. 
Acts 17, 6 to 7 says, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Caesar, uh, excuse me, another king, Jesus. There was a rule and a reign coming mentioned from of old, and that Jesus took up when he went to the, the right hand of the Father. God who made the world, Paul makes it really clear as he, as he spoke to the Greeks in Athens, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, and then it goes down, he says, he gives to all life, breath, and all, and all things. Liberty and freedom comes from God and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him. For it's not for it's in him we live and move and have our being. But here's the, here's the rub, though. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he shall judge the living and the dead. So there are spheres of influence that are all now called to submit to the Lordship of Christ, whether it's man, women, children, individuals, whether it's family governments, whether it's church governments, and whether it is state governments. He is in control. Paul go on to say in Romans, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. We think of him as Lord at the second coming when he judges the living and the dead. He's Lord now yeah. over the living Oh, his kingdom's just in heaven. Oh, his kingdom's in heaven. But it entails every nation, every tribe, every kingdom. Now he commands everyone to repent. So here in America, we can say we're Christian Americans who in the past have seen liberty and freedom and, and, and honored God's word. In other nations, not so. In China, they have a despot leading them. Their freedoms are trampled on. So Christians are able to still, though, bow to the Lordship of Christ, pray that this gospel might take root, and then that God might displace these evil governments. He will. He's going to judge them. Kiss the sun, unless he be angry with you. Oh, let's not talk and think about all that stuff. Let's just talk about the warm fuzzy in the church stuff. I don't want to debate and, and have to really sort this in my mind. We've got to sort this as Christians. We have to sort this as Christian Americans. We must understand what is the power of the gospel? What does it entail and where does the Lordship of Christ extend? Kelvin and a long list of Puritans, including guys like Abraham Kuyper, believed that Jesus was Lord of heaven and earth. Now, now, Abraham Kuyper says this, I love it, in his 1880 inaugural address to the Free University, October 20th, 1880. Man, in his antithesis, as fallen sinner or self-developing natural creature, returns again as the subject that he thinks or the object that prompts thought in every department, in every discipline, and with every investigator. Oh, no single piece of our mental world is to be hermetically sealed off from the rest. And there is not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. Jesus is Lord. Everybody will bow one day. But folks are bowing now. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of the Lordship of Christ. That's why we don't just give our freedoms away and not try to preserve them and keep them. You don't need your freedom, James. You're a Christian. You're going to heaven. I need my freedom to pray so that I might be able to raise my children right so that we, with, without them interfering with us, can train our children up in the way they should go 
so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. No, we'll just let the, the, the government schools teach the kids. They got this. Yeah, they got this. They've got a plan to take our children. They've got a plan to displace the Lordship of Christ. Just like back in the garden. Has God really not said? That's what Jesus did to overturn that. That's where when you talk about Kuiper, we talk, I've said it and you've heard it a bit here and there, about sphere sovereignty. Jesus is Lord over every sphere of sovereignty. So folks, we must saturate ourselves in the word of God so we might know what God requires of us. Cornelius Van Til, as I quoted a few weeks ago, the Bible is authoritative on everything which it speaks. Moreover, it speaks on everything. This is reflective of that Puritan tradition. Once laid out, the choice. Here's the choice, and we see it starkly. It's either autonomy and self-rule that leads to death, the wages of sin is death, or it's God's law, God's rule, that leads to life. So I think it's right as I see this portion of scripture here that we, in America, have been known in the past as a land of the free and the home of the brave. It's nothing to be despised about. If we recognize that our freedom came from Christ, and that you know what, there's a great number of men that founded and fought and established our country on right values. I'm open to debate on this. You can come and see me, we can talk about it. But I think scripture is clear, and I think if we look back at our history, we can see that that was our heritage. That's what's recognized by many in the world. That, that, that now they come to America, they're not getting what they originally thought. They come here and there'd be freedom. Freedom to worship as they pleased. So I'm not saying, as, as believing in Christianity, we force the Muslims to believe in Christ. But I don't want them to say, I can't believe in Jesus. That I can't recognize my right heritage. That we would have our laws reflect unbiblical laws. Right? I, I mean, it just makes sense. So this is just a thought. Let's, let's stand together and close in a word of prayer. And I want us to pray together the Lord's Prayer. So if you've got your Bibles, I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13 is where I'd like to uh, pick up together. So if you'd stand with me, grab, there's pew Bibles if you don't have a New King James Version in front of you. Let's read the Lord's Prayer together, starting at verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. John, would you come up and lead us in the final song of the